In today's episode, we're talking about movement. And in Taurus 2, it is true that your models will be moving around the table for many, many reasons. But in this segment specifically, we're going to be talking about the common moves that come from receiving an advance or a run order, because the rules are basically the same for all movement. To start off this entire process and figure out how far your models are going to be able to move on the battlefield, all you have to do is simply look at the unit's stat line. In its statistics, you're going to find the movement characteristic, and the movement characteristic basically translates to inches. So if a unit has a movement characteristic of five, like most pan-human sized characters, it's going to be able to move five inches on the battlefield. Pretty simple. When your unit receives an advance or a run order, it is going to be able to move across the battlefield depending on which order it received. In an advance order, a unit is able to move up to its single move characteristic. So if it has five, it can move from zero to five inches. Run order is where it gets a little bit complicated, but not much so. In a run order, just a basic run order, you're going to be able to move two of your movement characteristics. So that same unit that can move five inches is going to be able to double it to move up to 10 inches. And remember, this is the exact same no matter the move characteristic. So if you have someone that's a little bit slower with movement four, that single advance will get them up to four inches, where a run will get them eight inches. Or if you have a faster unit with move 10, they're gonna be able to advance 10 inches and run 20. Whenever an infantry, beast, or mounted unit receives a run order, they may choose to sprint. A sprint is different from a regular run, and you do have to announce it at the beginning, so there's no, you know, fiddliness of saying you want to sprint after you figure out you can't quite reach whatever target you were intending. A sprint works exactly like any other move, except it allows the unit to move three times their movement characteristic. So that same unit that can only move five inches can now sprint 15, and the really fast unit that can move 10 inches can now sprint 30 inches, which is pretty cool. The risk of performing a sprint, however, is that you have the potential of exhausting your unit. Once the sprint is complete, an agility test must be passed. If it is a failure, you will receive a single pin. It is important to note that this test for exhaustion must happen even if something on the battlefield, perhaps a reaction, prevents your unit from completing its sprint move in its full you know, distance. This makes sprinting somewhat of a gamble, but its benefits that it provides to defense is phenomenal, but we'll be covering that in further videos. Like in many war games and in Taras 2, movement is measured from a model's base. When making moves with your units, you're going to want to measure from the model's base edge or use the model's body if it doesn't have a base at all. And in the case of models that do not possess bases, since we had said in previous videos, facing does not matter in Antares 2. But what does matter is that any point on the model doesn't travel further than the movement allocation. That basically means that no matter what shape or whatever the vehicle is going to be, you're not gaining extra movement because of that. Also keep in mind when moving that you do have to remain in formation when the movement is over. And that just means that every model in the unit is within one inch of another. This can get a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with units with multiple different models within the same unit that have different stats. And that's mostly gonna happen when you have like weapons teams because heavy weapons have a little bit shorter movement than their crew. In any of these cases, move each model separately based on their movement characteristic and make sure at the end of the move, they're just in formation. It is also important to keep in mind when moving that the gap rule between units does have to be honored, but that is at the end of the movement. Uh, you can actually get within one inches of another unit when moving as long as that unit is not an enemy. And when making those moves, as long as your unit is a beast or infantry unit and you're passing through the same kind of unit, you can move freely. Otherwise, units do block movement from other units. Models that are within a unit that are moving can move freely over, through, around each other as many times as you'd like, as long as when the unit finishes its move, it is in formation and not on top of each other, obviously. As I stated before with keeping formation, if a unit possesses a separate weapon, like a support weapon or a heavy weapon, those weapons are still constricted to their basic move, even if the crew has a higher movement. It's also important to note that sometimes the size of the weapon might affect their ability to move through things like terrain. So just keep in mind and follow all the same rules we just talked about. Many units in Antares 2 are going to possess what are called equipment models, and this is most often going to be taking the form of buddy drones. But there's a myriad of different 
gadgets that are going to be brought to the table, and all of them behave in this way. When moving units that possess equipment, move all the non-equipment models first, and then once those are in their final position and in formation, you can then take all the equipment models and place them within formation of that unit. And that is stated specifically because it actually isn't important the distance that you measure. Equipment models really don't have measurements taken from them. So if you have a buddy drone, for instance, move from the back of a unit to the front of the unit, it is simply an aesthetic thing and has no bearings on the actual position. Obviously, our battlefields would be incredibly plain if they were just planes of nothingness. And so there is a lot of terrain in Antares 2, and that terrain is going to heavily affect the movement of your units. All of these different terrain pieces are going to be boiled down in the rules to fall into two categories. The first being area terrain, the second being obstacles. Area terrain is just going to be an large area that's annotated on the battlefield in whatever way you would like that represents something like a forest or a patch of boulders for instance and obstacles represent linear barriers and those are pretty obvious it could be like a wall it could be a hedgerow it could be a wall of giant mushrooms anything you can imagine but those are the two different types of terrain that we're going to be talking about Units that receive an advance order and are only moving a single move characteristic can go over obstacles with no penalty. However, units with a run order are going to have to test on their agility the moment they reach the obstacle. If they fail, they stop at the obstacle and are not allowed to cross over. If they pass, they can continue moving just as if it was open ground. Now it is important to note that if a unit has any single model that is actually up against and touching an obstacle at the start of its turn, the whole unit is considered to be in a defended position. And this is important for movement. Any unit that starts in a defending position may move over that obstacle with an advance, a run, a sprint, any movement with no penalty at all. These units are considered to be ready to have a heroic charge or maybe a valiant retreat. <laughs> but either way, these defended positions are incredibly advantageous when maneuvering is in play. The second type of terrain is going to be area terrain. And area terrain is further subdivided into three types. Open ground is considered area that has no penalty to movement and makes up the majority of the actual tabletop. Difficult terrain is considered rougher and harder to pass through, so any unit that is passing through said terrain is going to require an agility save. Now, if they pass this save, there's going to be no penalties to moving through said difficult terrain, but if they fail, they're going to incur any penalties associated with the specific type of area terrain. The last type of area terrain is impassable terrain, and by its name, it is impassable. These represent things like maybe ruins or a crashed spaceship, which is just so difficult to even hope to move through that it's considered impassable in terms of the game. Now, as I just stated, in terrain, when you're moving through difficult terrain, your unit is required to pass an agility test. And it's pretty simple. If you pass this test, there's actually no penalty to moving through said difficult terrain. But if you fail, your unit has to proceed moving at half rate. Now this simple rule can get a little bit more complicated when you're dealing with partial moves. And what I mean by that is, is if we take our example unit with the characteristic movement five, uh, if they're moving towards a woodland, which is considered difficult terrain, but need to pass two inches of open ground to get to there, they are only testing on that last three inches of movement that would be through the area terrain. If they pass their agility test, they would be able to move freely as if nothing were there and complete their move. But if they were to fail that test, the movement that they actually move through the area terrain is halved. And so in this example, their three inches would turn into an inch and a half. Now, this works in all situations, uh, just as I just stated. So any movement that is going through the area terrain is halved, not their total movement. And this concludes our basic look into movement. Now, if you have any questions about anything we went over today, leave them in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Do not forget, you can find all of this information in the free downloadable rulebooks on the new Antares Nexus, link in the description below. And if you wanna help support our channel in the easiest way possible, like this video, subscribe to our channel, and make sure you have notifications enabled. And as always, we'll, we'll see, see you on the tabletop. tabletop.